Good afternoon and welcome to an interesting presentation by Christopher Zagorski on new reads in crime fiction. Uh, I'm Rohini Gupta with the Howard County Library System. Uh, this is a webinar and only the panelists are visible. Both the chat and Q&A are open and we encourage you to post your comments and in chat and questions in the Q&A box. Uh, this event is being recorded and I will send the link out to you as soon as it's up on our YouTube channel. Meanwhile, feel free to pick up your pencil and jot notes as Christopher shares his uh, list of books. Uh, post event, we will send out a survey and we would love to hear from you. I'd also like to mention our local bookstore, Books with a Past, and they're great for purchasing any of the books that uh, Christopher mentions. Uh, before we start, please mark Tuesday. Uh, May 25th for our class on emotional intelligence in the job search. In this class, uh, Yolanda Rayford, who is the senior career coach at Easter Seals Veteran Staffing Network, will discuss the importance of emotional intelligence as you search for your dream job. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Christopher Zagorski, influencer and award-winning crime fiction blogger. Christopher was awarded the Eggers Raven Award in 2018. The Egger Allen Poe Awards, popularly called the Eggers, are presented every year by the Mystery Writers of America. These awards honor the best in mystery fiction, nonfiction, television, film, and theater, published or produced in the previous year. The Eggers present uh, the Raven Award to non-writers who contribute significantly to the mystery genre. If you are a to be published mystery author, you want to quickly snag your spot on the Zagorski book review calendar. <laughs> Chris also has a regular column, Central Booking in Deadly Pleasures magazine and writes reviews for Crime Spree magazine and on UK based websites. Christopher's blog is Bolo Books. Any guesses what it stands for? Type it in chat. It's a quick mystery for us to solve. And here is the clue. Ebola Books is designed to highlight new books on or just before their release date. And we will lead, leave it up to Christopher to solve that mystery for us. Chris, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much, Rainey, for having me and thanks to the Howard County Library for putting on these events and asking me to come and speak today. Here we go. Look, I got the Bolo books. Stands for, are you ready for it? Be on the lookout. It's an acronym commonly used by the police. You'll hear it on all of your detective shows. And um, I thought it was a clever use for the title of the, of the blog when I launched it. Um, the success of that title varies. Some people get it right away. Some people take years to get it and they're shocked when they understand and didn't catch it on. <laughs> so, um, now you all know the inside track. I'm going to share my screen here and start my PowerPoint. And I'm going to tell you that I'm going to be discussing today books from 2020 to 2021. The reason I'm including some 2020 titles is because I feel like with the pandemic, some of those books didn't get the attention they deserved. Um, we were all locked away and they couldn't really do their promotion as normal. So I want to help in any way I can. So I'm picking a few favorites from 2020 and then we'll talk about stuff that came out in 2021 already and then a few titles that are not yet out. Um, I've divided them up in categories to make it easy so that you can know what you like to read and you can take notes from um, my presentation. So we're going to start with the cozy mysteries and one of my favorite new novels of the year from Mia P. Manansala. This book is called Arsenic and Adobo. It is a Filipino community novel um, an own voices story for Mia. So she um, introduces her character, who Lila, who is going through a bad breakup and decides to go back home and um, help out with her family's restaurant that is struggling, um, Tita Rosie's Kitchen, which is the name of the series, because this will be a series. Um, so Tita's Rosie's Kitchen is um, 
struggling and suddenly once Lila gets there, a nasty food critic dies. Um, this critic also happens to be one of Lila's ex boyfriends. So she um, becomes a suspect and also wants to solve what's going on with there. Uh, what's really great about this book, not only is the food, there's so much Filipino food in this book that will make you rush out to your local restaurant, um, but there's also the surrounding characters like her meddling aunties who are just, they want her to have a relationship so bad they just can't stay out of her life. Um, and those aunties are named April, May, M-A-E, and June. So April, May, and June are just getting involved in her life in every way they possibly can, and she just is done with it. Um, it's also a little edgier than some cozies we'll see. I'm not talking, we're not serial killers here or anything, but um, uh, Mia wants to go into some political and, and racial discussions uh, being a Filipino and, and how people of color are treated in the country. So there's some of that in there, which is not typically seen in all cozies. The next cozy I'm going to mention is Sherry Harris, and I know Sherry's in the audience. Um, Sherry, Sherry Harris is From Beer to Eternity came out last year. It's the debut of a new series for her, and the second book will be out uh, any time now, July, I believe. Um, From Beer to Eternity is the Chloe Jackson story. She is also um, going to a new place to help her friend's grandmother with a saloon in the panhandle of Florida. Um, so, of course, when she gets there again, as in all cozies, a dead body ends up and Chloe wants to investigate. Um, I should go on record as saying here that one of the characters in the book is loosely, and I say very loosely, um, based on me. So um, I'm not completely unbiased here, um, but I think you'll still like the book. The Redneck Riviera is such an interesting part of the country that a lot of people don't know about. We uh, So much humor and stuff comes out of that area. Um, so Sherry's written a laugh out loud funny tale here. And the second book, um, will be out a time to swill. Like I said, I think it's in July. So those are my cozy suggestions. I'm gonna move on now to historical mysteries. And you'll notice um, each of my slides has the Bola Books website here. So you can visit the blog and find out more books in each of these categories that I've covered. Um, historical mysteries, I'm gonna start off with Marco Caracari's debut, Blackout. It's actually te te technically not a historical because it's set in present day, but there's a strong thread that's set during the 70s. So I put it in the historical category because that part of the story is very interesting. Um, there was an infamous New York blackout in the 70s. People who were around then probably remember it. Um, lots of rioting and, and things happening. And during that event, the main character of this series is a young boy and he witnesses his father, who is a cop, get killed. And it sort of changes his life. And the book picks up in the modern day when this young boy is now older and he's actually in the midst of a hookup on the roof of his apartment building when he is unknowingly drugged and in the midst of his confusion, he witnesses a murder, what he believes to be a murder across the street in another apartment complex, not unlike Rear Window. Um, but of course he then blacks out. And by the time he wakes up, he's down on the street. His hookup partner is gone. The police are there asking him what's going on. And he explains to them that he's witnessed this murder. They go into the apartment across the street to investigate and there's no body, no sign of any kind of crime. And they think he's just in a stupor from his blackout. Uh, he then says that's not the case eventually in the second chapter or so, the police find a body and they begin to connect it back to what's happening there. But instead of being uh, helping, he becomes a suspect in that crime. And those crimes, the one that happened in the 70s with the death of his father and the current one, merge together in very interesting ways. Um, it's again an own voices story. So Marco um, has written a gay character for the lead. Um, I don't think he's ever witnessed a murder himself, <laughs> but um, he, he really brings authenticity to the gay experience. So anyone looking to um, learn more about that can read this. Um, and now we're going to move on to 
another new, Erica Ruth Neubauer has written a historical series, two books of which are out, Murder at the Mina House came out in 2020 and Murder at Wedgefield Manor came out earlier this year. They are in the Jane Wonderly series. They're set in the 1920s. The first book that Murder at the Mina House takes place in Egypt. So it will appeal very much to fans of Elizabeth Peters. Um, her bringing to life of Egypt is incredible. Um, it's an amateur sleuth. She's just on vacation with her aunt and she just stumbles upon a crime and wants to help solve it. Uh, then the second book, uh, Erica Ruth has decided she wants to take on another trope of the, of the industry. So it's a uh, manor house type mystery. Um, think of Downton Abbey with bodies. Um, both books help deal with the role of women in the 20s and, and things that they were not allowed to do. And Jane is one of those women who's pushing against the restrictions placed upon them. And there's this sizzling romance that happens from book one to book two that hopefully we'll see come into full force in book three, but um, it, it, it's quite the romance. So there's a little bit of everything in these, this series for people. Okay, now I'm going to move on to my favorite type of crime fiction, domestic and psychological suspense. They're pretty much interchangeable these days. Um, originally, domestic suspense would have been limited to families and friendships and those kind of things, but psychological suspense also covers those, so the line is blurred between them, um, so we just lumped them all together. Rachel Housel Hall, one of my favorite writers, came out last year with And Now She's Gone. This is a blend of a domestic suspense and a PI novel. Um, it deals with Grayson Sykes. She's a newbie PI at a firm and she's given her first assignment, her first big assignment after having done little things to find Isabel Lincoln who has, at the request of her husband who's a doctor. He says she's gone missing and taken their dog and he needs Grayson to help him find her. Um, so she begins that hunt. We get some other storylines that are woven in there. Um, this one has lots of twists in it. Uh, deals with the cult of toxic masculinity that we've seen throughout the, our society. Um, and it brings diversity in a way without making it the forefront. There, there, this, this is not a book about the black experience. We're, we're not gonna deal with um, race relations directly, although of course all of that influences everything in Grayson Sykes's life. So um, it's there, but this is just a book that is not, it, it's just a domestic suspense story that happens to have a black lead and will keep you reading all the way through. So I highly recommend it. It actually was my top read of 2020. So in my, when my year end list came out, this was the book that was on the top of that list. So, you know, I'm a fan. Next, Amy Malloy. Amy Malloy came out last year with Good Night Beautiful. I put this book on the list even though I can't really talk about it. Um, you know, readers of domestic suspense and psychological suspense love twists. And there's such a now a need for twists in books that authors are throwing in things that are completely unrealistic in order just to get a twist in there. So that annoys me. This is an author who has succeeded in putting not one, but two twists into this book. Um, organically, completely shocking. I almost can guarantee that you'll be knocked off your socks by the first one and probably by the second one as well. Um, what I can tell you, and again, it's very little I can tell you about this book. It's about a couple, Sam and Annie, who are newly married. They've relocated to a remote area called Chestnut Hills so that Sam can open up a psychiatry practice. This move also brings them closer to Sam's mother who's in the late stages of dementia at a, an assisted living facility. Um, once they arrive, Amy is bored out of her mind. She doesn't know anybody in this town. So she begins um, to try to alleviate that boredom. But before she can even get very far, her husband completely disappears. Um, off the face of the earth and she becomes entangled in what happened to him and trying to convince the police that something happened when they think that he just ran off with um, one of his patients to have an affair. Um, Malloy really uses 
the reader's expectations to turn the story on its heels for them. So what you expect to happen isn't going to happen, but the way she makes what you expect happen into that twist is just magical to watch. I think this book should have been bigger than it was. Um, so I hope you'll check it out. I think it's a really great novel. Now I've paired up two books that really have um, connections besides the word eight um, in both of them, Alex Pavese's debut and then Peter Swanson's latest. Um, I'll start with Alex Pavese's The Eighth Detective. It's um, set on a Mediterranean island. There's Julia who's an editor um, for a publishing house. And she, there, there's this famous author named Grant McAllister who used to write books and has stopped writing books. And she's found his old manuscripts that are out of print and she wants to reprint a collection of his books. But she, in reading the stories, she's noticed that each one of the stories has uh, uh, something wrong with it. Like there's actually a flaw in the plotting or things that couldn't happen. So she wants to find out if she could get those errors edited out of the story. So she meets with this very elderly Grant McAllister on this Mediterranean island where he's now living um, to interview him and discuss the stories. So the novel alternates chapters between their conversation on the Mediterranean island and then the eight stories that she wants to compile. So the reader is put in the position of Julia. You get to read the stories as she read them and find out the flaw that she, see if you can figure out the flaw that she found in the story. And then the next chapter of conversation, she reveals what the problem is and asks Grant why that happened or why he made that error. And he repeatedly tells her different answers that makes her begin to suspect that there's something more going on with what's the, what the flaws are, that maybe they're not flaws at all. Um, Peter Swanson, Eight Perfect Murders, again, one of my favorite books of 2020, similarly uses the, the, the eight, in this book, there's a bookseller who has listed on the bookseller's website, the eight books that have perfect murders in them. Um, this bookseller thinks there's only eight of them and he thinks that every one of them is the perfect way to murder somebody and get away with it. So he posted this list um, several years ago and at the start of the book, the police have come to the bookshop to tell him that people are actually being killed in the way of these classic books. Now, I will say that if you're a fanatic of crime fiction, you've probably read some of these eight books, but you probably haven't read all of them. If you're going to plan to want to read those eight books, I would suggest doing so before you read Eight Perfect Murders, because of course it will ruin those books for you because they discuss how the murders were um, perpetrated. And those books range from everything on Strangers on a Train and the ABC Murders by Agatha Christie to Double, Double Indemnity and The Secret History. Um, that's just named four of them, there are four others. Uh, when I read it, I had read six of the eight. So there were two books that I did not read. I wish I had read those two books before I read Eight Perfect Murders, but I didn't. I did go back and read them afterwards, however. Um, so it works either way, but it's better if you don't know. Um, I mean, if you want to be surprised when you read the actual first novel, you probably want to start those first. Um, but anyway, this bookseller, again, then has to investigate uh, or help the police figure out why this, these murders are happening based on the list of books that he posted. Next up, we have Zakaya Delilah Harris's debut, The Other Black Girl. I saw this on the back of on Rohini's bookshelf when we started. Um, this will, book is not out yet. It comes out June 1st, I believe. <laughs> So Zakaya has um, written a story set in the publishing world. Um, it's about a woman who is the only black employee at a publishing house. She is dealing every day with microaggressions and rudeness from her other employees um, that sometimes they intentionally cause and sometimes they don't really even know what a microaggression is, but she's dealing with them every day. And as the novel starts, another black woman is hired to sit in the cubicle across from her and our heroine is excited that she's finally gonna have a friend, except that suddenly it turns into a rivalry between the two of them and um, their friendship doesn't really go the way um, anyone would have hoped. 
uh, it's a very, very own voices story that it's very, very powerful, has a lot to say about society as it exists today at the publishing industry in particular, um, while also telling a gripping story that will have you flipping the pages to figure out how this is going to end. Next up is Carol Goodman. Carol Goodman can always be counted on for writing a good book each year. Um, she's one of my favorite writers. The Stranger Behind Me, which I keep wanting to call Beside Me, but it's The Stranger Behind Me, um, is her 2021 book. I believe it's out in, I'm gonna say June, late June, maybe July. Um, it's set in a Magdalene laundry that was in Manhattan. So it was the first time I actually learned that there were Magdalene laundries over here in the um, US. I thought that they were only overseas. So that in, by itself was an interesting tidbit of information. But it deals with a journalist who writes a expose about the sexual abuse and harassment perpetrated by a newspaper mogul. Shocking, that never happens in real life. Um, and the day after her story is published, she's attacked out on the street. Um, she's not sure if there's any connection, but she fears for her life. So she decides to move into a new secure building in the area um, that used to be a Magdalene laundry and is now a, a, a pretty much a fortress where you need to get, to get in, you have to have special privileges and stuff. So she moves into this building and meets a 96 year old resident who is living there. This woman um, witnessed a murder way back in the days and moved into this house um, to also hide. So the two of them are bonding over their, their seclusion from society and their fear of what's happening outside when another third resident uh, moves in and throws both of their lives into turmoil. Um, sort of a gothic feel to this and an interesting take on the Me Too movement. We've seen so many books um, about the Me Too movement that um, it's getting repetitive. I think Carol Goodman has found a different tact here. Um, so I enjoyed that. Next up is PJ Vernon's debut, Bathhouse. Um, this similar to the previous book, Blackout. Um, this is an own voices story from a gay storyteller. Um, Bathhouse is a story of Oliver and Nathan. They're a couple that are happily married um, and they seem, everything seems to be going perfectly. When Nathan goes away on a business trip, however, Oliver can't resist the urge to visit the local gay bathhouse in order to have some extracurricular activities. Unfortunately for him, he hooks up with a guy who, a, tries to kill him inside of the bathhouse and barely escapes with his life, um, rushes out to get to the police station, reports it before he realizes that he has to then tell the police, please don't tell my husband I wasn't supposed to be there. So the police aren't really on board with that, but he manages to convince them. Um, and everything seems like it's gonna be swept under the carpet until suddenly he starts to get text messages from the a uh, person who attacked him threatening to also expose um, what he was doing while his husband was away. So this is a, a typical to, to domestic suspense um, plot line that works and feels fresh because it's a gay couple. We don't see that very often. Um, or um, actually, I can't think of an example of a domestic suspense with a gay couple at the center. Um, so it, it, it really feels fresh. Um, it will appeal to people who, um, want to know again more about that community. Um, as a gay man, I found a lot in there that was very interesting and, and I could relate to. Um, so check it out. Don't be afraid. It's not going to hurt you. <laughs> Next up is Mary Dixie Carter's debut. Mary Dixie Carter has written The Photographer. My review of this just went up this week. Um, it's a very interesting story. We, we all know pictures and we all take pictures and we, and we look back at pictures and we look at the memories that they bring about for us. But rarely, unless it's a selfie, rarely do we ever think about the photographer who took the picture. So this is a story of a woman who is a photographer who goes into um, parties and weddings and things and film and, and photographs them for people. Her specialty is children's parties. So at the beginning of the book, she is hired to do the Straub's birthday party for their 11 year old daughter. And as soon as she enters the house, she's in wonder at the gorgeousness of this 
um, extravagant house and lifestyle that these straws live. And she decides that she wants to be a part of it and she'll do anything she can to make that happen. The book is very streamlined. It's just a little over 250 pages, I think. Um, everything is focused on the, this woman. Her name is Delta Dawn, named after the Tanya Tucker song. Um, this photographer Delta Dawn and her relationship with this family. So there's no extraneous subplots or anything else to distract from you. And the author did this intentionally, I suspect, to put us in the mindset of this wacky lady. I mean, she will do anything to become part of this family. And you just, every time you turn the page, you're just wondering what she's going to do next and will she actually get away with what she's doing. Um, so we don't often see the obsessive, uh, psychologically disturbed person being a woman. So that was a fresh take on it, and uh, I really enjoyed it and can't wait to see what Mary is going to bring us next. Alexandra Andrews is my next choice. Who is Maud Dixon? Who is Maud Dixon? This is a very good question. It's actually a pen name for this famous author that exists in this fictional world. Um, and Florence Darrow is an assistant in a publishing house, another publishing set book. Um, and she has aspirations of being someday being a writer, but things are not going well for her. So she's just pretty much reading the slush pile at the publishing house. Um, when she suddenly offered the opportunity to be the assistant to Maul Dixon, this, this pen named author that nobody knows. So she flies off to a secluded home with this woman and is revealed to her who Maul Dixon really is. Only she and the editor um, know. And she thinks this is a great opportunity for her. She'll be able to break into the, the, to the publishing world, learn more about how books are written um, by this, this very famous author. Uh, this very famous author who's only written one book, mind you. So this author is writing a second book and has been writing it for a very long time, which is why she was hired to try to help with the research. So Florence and Maud, the, the, the fictional Maud, rush off to um, a vacation where they're supposed to be doing research for the book. And a tragic car accident happens. And Maud is, the, 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 the fictional Maud disappears. And Florence is left there wondering, maybe she should just pretend to be Maud and, and make her entry into the publishing world as quick as possible. So what she decides to do is much more complicated than that. And uh, we'll keep you turning the pages and wondering who really is Maul Dixon. L.R. Dorn is a writing duo. Um, I don't know if they're husband and wife. I don't think they are. I think they're just screenwriting partners um, who have written movies together. They've decided to write a novel. The novel is called The Anatomy of Desire. It's written completely in script form. So there's no exposition in this novel. Still a novel, but there's no exposition. All you're getting is dialogue, various different types of dialogue, court testimony, um, interactions between characters uh, at different settings, um, but no exposition. So you need to fill all that in yourself, which is an interesting experience in reading, uh, one I quite enjoyed. And actually I hear the audiobook of this is very good because they've had, they have different actors playing all the different parts. So that might be a way to go too. But it's the story of this very high placed influencer who is out on a canoe with her friend when the canoe capsizes and the friend drowns. And she's then accused of murdering that friend and shows a lot about what social media is like these days and how we can see you can go from being the biggest thing one day to being canceled and, and, and vilified the next, uh, sometimes, you know, deservedly so and sometimes not so deservedly so. Um, I can tell you while you're reading this book, your your loyalties will flat, flip back and forth multiple times all the way up to the very end. And even after it's over, you may still feel like maybe the outcome wasn't the outcome that was deserved. Um, quite an interesting book. I'd be interested to see what this um, duo do next um, because I don't think they can do the script idea again, but it was very effective for this story. So I'm hoping that. Ben McPherson is another writer who is probably not known to many of you. He only has one other book. It's called A Line of Blood. It's one of my favorites. Um, he wrote a book called The Island. This is actually the UK cover. I forgot to grab the um, US cover, 
the U.S. cover is called Love and the book is called Love and Other Lies in the U.S. So write that down because I shouldn't put that up here. But it's the island in the U.K., which is where I read it because I couldn't wait. It is um, centered on a large terrorist attack that affects Norway. Many of you may remember an actual case where um, armed gunmen stormed a camp, a childhood, a child's school or camp in Norway and killed all of the students. Um, so this book deals with that, but it's not really about that part that happens in the first chapter. It's a gripping chapter that's harrowing to read. Um, but it's really about the fallout of this one family. One of family's daughter has gone missing on the island. Um, in, in this case, all of the people are not killed. I think in the real case, everybody was killed. Um, but in this case, some people survived. So there's a question of whether the daughter is, is dead or if she just hasn't been found yet. So the family on the mainland is dealing with what's going on on the island. They can't get to the island because of the, the police activity. Um, and she has a younger sister who's traumatized by this whole thing and, and deals with each family members, how they reconcile what could have happened to their daughter. Um, very powerful read. Um, like I said, the first chapter is a tough read, so uh, be prepared when you sit down to read that chapter that it's just gonna, any, anytime you have children being harmed, it's difficult, but this is written pretty realistically, so it, it's difficult. But once you get through that, it really becomes about the trauma and overcoming the trauma. So there's not so much of that after you get through the first chapter. <laughs> now I'm gonna go from there to Megan Abbott, who is another of my favorite writers. Megan Abbott has been writing for years and she's lately been focusing on females and female relationships. Um, she's written about cheerleaders and gymnasts and, and famous or, or female scientists. Uh, her new book is focused on the ballet world and tells the story of um, two sisters who inherit their mother's ballet studio and the one sister's married and then the other sister decides that they need to upgrade the, the studio to make it more appealing to new students. So they hire a handyman. That foursome becomes the, the, the clash that moves this novel forward. Uh, again, it's an interesting look at sisters and that relationship, um, especially sisters who are in a field that's so competitive as ballet is. Um, so I think people will like that. Uh, if you liked any of her other books about the cheerleaders or the gymnasts, you will definitely love this book. Uh, I think it's out in, I think it was due in July. I think it's now been pushed back to August. So I think this is the latest book on my list. So that'll be a late summer book for you um, to check out. Traditional mysteries. These are mysteries that sort of don't fit in any other category, but are mysteries themselves. El Casamano was a young adult writer. She won an Edgar Award for one of her young adult novels, um, but she's moved on to the adult world with this hilarious uh, Finley Donovan is Killing It. This is a story of, again, a publishing story. It's interesting. We're seeing a lot of stories set in the publishing world. This is about an author who um, is working on her next novel and she meets her agent at the Panera Bread in her neighborhood and they're discussing her contract and how she needs to have another hit or she's going to lose her contract and the person the lady sitting to the table next to that to the, at the table next to them overhears parts of the conversation and then begins to suspect that Finley is a hitman and that the hit and contract they're talking about are murders and she happens to want to get rid of her husband so she decides she's going to hire Finley to um, kill her husband so she passes her a note secretively across the Panera bread and Finley reads it shocked of course but then realizes that she could really use the money what the money money this woman is offering is really good but of course she's not going to kill anyone but she thinks well maybe she could just investigate and see what this woman's problems are with this husband and settle it in another way and maybe the woman will give her some of the cash so she sets out to do that and pairs up with her nanny who um is there to help her with the child, but the husband, for many reasons, that she's not the nanny anymore. So um, 
she says, I'll keep you on the paycheck and you just help me do this investigation of this man. And they become, in my review, I described them as the Lucille Ball and um, Ethel Mertz of crime fiction. They are hilarious. I mean, everything they could do that could possibly go wrong goes wrong. And uh, those of us in the crime community, we often talk about our friends as those people we could call who would help us bury a body. Well, in this case, it becomes a literal situation of burying a body and who do you call when that need happens? Um, it's very, seems very light. There's an underthread of darkness through this book. So don't think of it as a complete comedy. I mean, you will laugh out loud, but there is a, a thread of um, some dark stuff happening. And it is the beginning of a series. So Finley Donovan gets away with murder. Get, I don't know what's next, but um, she will be back. I think it's not till 2022. So it's still a while. So you can read this book this summer and wait for that one next um, winter. So, David Hesco Wombly Wyden getting much acclaim for his debut, Winter Counts. Again, an own voices story, this one, Indigenous people story, um, a, a community we don't see too much of. Virgil Wounded Horse is a vigilante. He, he, oh, there's this role still in place that on reservations, only certain crimes can be investigated by the native people. Often they have to call in the white folk from the sound around community. And you can imagine how that goes. So on reservations, often there'll be these people who become almost vigilante type people who will solve your crime. If your daughter's raped, they're gonna handle it. Um, whereas the white sheriff in town will not. So v Virgil Wounded Horse is one of those kind of characters. So he, he, he's definitely an anti-hero, but you will be cheering for him. But he becomes invested in the uh, narcotic in infiltration of the reservations when his nephew becomes uh, a victim of drug addiction. And he wants to stop these drugs from coming into um, his secluded reservation. So he sets out on that. It is also the beginning of a series. I don't think that there's a new book in the series until a new novel until 2022, but there are two short stories coming out, one of which I'll talk about later, um, that feature Virgil Wounded Horse um, in the story. So you can learn more about him before the next novel is out. Next up, Jane Harper. If you're not reading Jane Harper and you're a crime fiction fan, you're missing out. Jane is one of the best of the new people that have come along in the last five or so years. In fact, her first novel, The Dry, um, set in Australia, is was turned into a movie in Australia and it dropped today on our streaming services here in the US. So if you haven't read the book or you have read the book, you can watch the movie this evening, uh, which I plan to do. It was a great book and all of the subsequent three books, and this is her fourth book since The Dry, that's excellent. Jane is great at merging the in Australian environment into her books. So each one is set in a different type environment. The Dry was set in the desert, the Aboriginal desert. This one's set at, the, at a seaside um, community that flourished because of ship um, shipping activities. And there was a tragic accident that happened in the on the cliffs. Uh, in the past and now there's now a monument of statues that stand out in the water that are called the survivors that that is where the title of the book comes from but it deals with uh, a couple Kieran and Mar Mia who are returning home to their childhood uh, where they grew up with their infant daughter Kieran's brother died in an accident at sea not the historical sea but another accident that happened out at sea um, his dad is dealing with dementia and his mom is the sole caregiver so he's come to town hoping that he can help relieve some of her stress um, they meet up with some other friends and some new people. And one of them is a photographer, a, a aspiring photographer, and she's found dead on the beach the next morning. And suddenly all of the um, residents of the town become suspects in what happened to her. Uh, juxtaposing the grand scale tragedy of this big shipwreck that happened and little lurk shipwrecks that have happened against the small town life of a family is quite innovative. Um, and you'll feel like you're standing on the cliffs when she describes some of the views from there and what's happening. Um, there's a cave in one of the cliffs that the kids used to hang out with that factors into the story. So um, very much an environmental type thing. You'll, if, if you can't go on vacation yet, quite yet, you can go on vacation virtually by reading this book. 
Ellie Griffiths has a series, um, several series actually, but this is The Postscript Murders, the second in her books featuring Harbinder Carr. Harbinder is an Indian Sikh lesbian. Um, so she's not a character we've seen very much in fiction and I, she's one of my favorite new characters. Um, she's not out to her family yet. They, her family is very strict Hindu and doesn't, or, or, or Sikh and doesn't, um, really appreciate the gay community so she's never told them that she's a lesbian um, in this book an older lady dies staring out her window in her rocking chair seems like it's just a regular um, natural death and her friends at uh, three friends her nurse another resident at the nursing home where they live and the coffee shop owner across the street begin to believe that she was murdered and bring in Harbinder to help them figure out what happened. When Harbinder gets there, she sees this woman has hundreds and hundreds of books on the shelf and almost all of them have dedications to the woman who is dead on the chair. So she's like, why did this woman have so many crime fiction books and why is everybody thanking her? So she begins to um, investigate that. It takes them off to a book convention, a crime fiction convention. So those of us that attend them um, will love those chapters that are set at the convention. Um, and it, the way it comes, all comes together is, is fascinating. Uh, Ellie won the Edgar for best novel last year for the first book in this series, The Stranger Diaries. I call it a series, they're really linked only by Harbinder. Um, so you don't really need to read the first one to read the second one. You can read them in either, either order. And um, Ellie has told me there'll be at least one more story fe featuring Harbinder. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, noir, I'm going to go over a little bit. I don't call these noir. I'm not sure they're really as dark as noir really is, but S.A. Cosby is the biggest thing happening in crime fiction at the moment. Blacktop Wasteland was his 2020 book. It was my second favorite book of last year. It's a um, novel about a heist. It, it features Beauregard Montag, who is a man who got out of the criminal field when he had a family and, and is now trying to be on the straight and narrow, but he's struggling with um, paying the bills. He gets an offer to be a heist, uh, the getaway driver for a heist one more time, and he reluctantly goes into that and things don't go as planned. Uh, that book is, like I said, was last year's book. This year's book, Razorblade Tears, is my favorite book of the year to date, um, 2021. I can't imagine there'll be a book that comes along that knocks it from that spot. If there is that book out there, I can't wait to read it because Razorblade Tears is so good that I can't imagine it. I, it's not only my favorite book of this year, it's on my top list of books of all time. Razorblade Tears starts out with two fathers at the grave at a graveside, one white and one black. Um, they are burying their sons who happen to be married to each other. Both fathers were not accepting of their gay child children's lives, um, so had strained relationships, but they are certain that they want to get revenge for their deaths, even though they didn't understand what their sons were going through. Um, they still love their sons and they are not going to let their deaths go unavenged. So they join together um, and set out to get revenge. Uh, these two people have nothing in common, except they have everything in common and don't know it. Um, so there's a lot about race relations in it. Like I said, one of the, hus one of the fathers is white and one is black. Um, the, the white man is a lower class and the black man is uh, running a business. Um, so they have conflicts and, and their expectations of what the other person should be like don't match up with what the reality is. And um, the investigation into this crime is, is just keep your tissues handy. I mean, it doesn't have tears in the title for no reason. Um, like I said, I cannot imagine a book uh, this year being better and, and maybe it, it's in everybody's favorite book. Just read it. <laughs> Matthew Wesolowski is a name you're not going to know. He's more um, known over in the UK. He has a series of books called Six Stories. This is, you can see it says at the top, an episode of Six Stories. Six Stories is a fictional podcast in which the main character interviews six people involved in a crime. Um, and you get the transcript of the podcast 
of each six person, different people, and then you're left at the end to put together the pieces all on your own. This one's called Deity. It deals with a, and they, they can be read in any order. There's no connection other than the podcast. Um, this one deals with a pop superstar who died in a fire mysteriously. Um, there are six witnesses and they're gonna tell their stories about what happened. Um, when I was reading it, I couldn't help but think of Michael Jackson and what went on in his life. So that gives you a little clue about what's going on here or could be going on here. And again, there's really no answers. You're left as the reader to come up with your own answers. You're just given the six different stories um, and led to um, left to make your own decisions. Rohini, I don't know what the time is, so just keep me on track. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Writers of Color Anthology, which is coming out at the end of the year. This is a great way if you want to. Writers of Color are not still not getting the recognition they deserve. Um, so we're trying to support them in every way we can. If you want to try them, this is a collection of short, short stories by some of the best in that community. Um, so you can try little snippets of their stories before you read their big books if you want. This is where you'll find one of those um, stories from Virgil Wounded Horse um, featuring him, um, a, a horrific story, and then um, some many others are in there as well. So check that out. How so am I doing? We, are, uh, we have, uh, we're at, we have 10 minutes more to go. So if anybody has any questions, uh, you can go ahead and put them in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, we will carry on with the books. So go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A and chat, and uh, we'll get to them. There is one. <laughs> Sherry is, is asking, how many books do you read in a year? <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot. It's over a hundred. This year, I'm not reading as many as I read previously. I've, I've intentionally stepped back this year and decided that I will only cover books on the blog that I really want to read um, instead of trying to read everything that comes across my desk. Um, but it'll still be over 100 books by the end of the year. Okay. And when does Razorblade Tears uh, release? Razorblade Tears is due out in June. Um, I think it's the middle of June. Uh, don't quote me on that. I should have looked that up because I knew y'all would be interested, but I believe it's uh, June. Okay. So not too far, soon. And you can read the first one, the, his, his first novel, not connected, but Blacktop Wasteland is also great. So read that one first if you haven't. Okay, great. So we can carry on. I think everybody wants to hear about the books that you're talking about. If any Sounds questions good. pop up, I'll let you know. Sounds good. I'm going to talk only briefly about spy novels. It's not a, series, a, a, a genre I'm particularly a huge fan of, but I did love these books and discovered um, that rereading them, that I loved them even more over the pandemic. I read all seven of them or six of them again. Starts with Slow Horses. It's the first book in the series. It actually been picked up by Apple TV to be turned into a series. So we'll see that with Gary Oldman next year, I believe. But this is a story set in the UK about a band of um, spies who have all made mistakes in their real careers and have now, rather than be fired, they've been sequestered into this separate society of slow horses, who people who've made mistakes in their career and are just going to ride out until retirement, except none of them want to do so. So they still get involved in actual spy um, activities. And you get to know them sort of, I was actually talking with Rohini about Louise Penny before this it started. And these, these characters are sort of like Louise Penny type characters. You get to know each one of them, you, you bond with them and each of the books, others take precedence about which ones they're going, what, what they're gonna do. Um, and their relationships between each other is very interesting. The only difference, um, is that Mick, Mick Heron is not afraid of killing them off. So don't get too um, connected to anybody because you never know if they'll be around by the next book. These are people who are in dangerous jobs and, and they may not make it through the current book you're reading. A little bit about Young Adult. Courtney Summers won uh, Edgar for her book, Sadie. Her new book this year is called The Project. Just briefly, it's a story about a cult. It's about two sisters, one who's involved in the cult and one who's a journalist outside. The one outside decides she'll do an expose newspaper series about the cult 
in the efforts to infiltrate it and then rescue her sister um, from what she believes to be a harmful situation. I found it fascinating. I've always found cults to be an interesting phenomenon. I, I really can never understand how people can get sucked into those. But when you read this book, you sort of understand, especially for young people, how they can be manipulated to believe something that might not be true um, in order to be to be controlled by a master head of the cult. So um, I loved it. Another one, Richie Narvaez. Narvaez's book came out last year. It's again, one of those books I think did, didn't get the attention. It could have gone up in the historical section. It's set in the 70s, Holly Hernandez and the Death of Disco. Um, very, very touching book about Holly Hernandez is in a school in New York City. She's living a normal life. Everything's fine until one of her teachers is murdered and, or killed. And her mother who happens to be the local police um, person comes in to investigate and then her life, her social life goes to hell quickly. Um, but one of her other friends, Xander, is accused of the murder. Um, he's quickly figured out that he couldn't have murdered it, but he and Holly together decide, or not even together, they decide they're going to figure out who murdered it, but they want each wants to do it before the other one does. So you get alternating chapters from Holly's perspective and Xander's perspective on the investigation and you as the reader can put together, they're not communicating with each other with what they're finding. So you know more than each of those two characters um, for much of the novel and it ends in a, at a disco tech that's um, typical of the era. So it's, it's fun, it's a fun little book. Um, I think it's great to bring young readers in to our crime fiction community, um, sort of like a modern day Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys. So um, a little more racy than those books, but that's the society we're in these days. <laughs> And then I'll end with just some nonfiction titles. I have two of them. The MWA Handbook came out just recently. It's um, MWA, as um, Rohini said, was gave me the Raven Award in 2018. And uh, many of their writers have come together to put essays together about writing mysteries. It's called How to Write Mystery. Um, it Readers will love this book too. It just talks about settings and characters and creating those kind of things. And then what happens after your book comes out, what are reviews and all that kind of thing, what that, what's that experience like? So everybody can get something from it. It's not really a handbook on how to write a mystery, although you could use some of the advice in there um, to do so. And similarly, my other choice, How Done It, it's a very similar book, um, but it's from the UK. Um, it's the Detection Club is the oldest and most famous network of crime fiction writers in the world. Um, it's still running today. It's been running for years. Agatha Christie and Dorothy L. Sayers were all members of the Detection Club. And these are essays from 91 of the members throughout history, um, some current members and some that have passed on and all linked together by short little antidotes from the current president, Martin Edwards. So it's great for both readers and writers. And lastly, I just wanna tell you about more than Malice. I am the secretary on the board of directors for Malice Domestic. This year, our convention is going virtual. So we're going to have that July 14th to 17th. Um, it's a $60 registration fee, which is very reasonable considering the level of authors we have at this event. You can find out who all those authors are by going to www.malicedomestic.org. Um, I can tell you, you'll see names like um, Lee Child, Charlene Harris, Louise Penny, um, uh, just anybody who's anybody, there's a lot of names on there and we tried to cover every part of the community we possibly could. So there's some um, Agatha Christie scholars that are coming. There's gonna be some discussion of true crime. So there's a 20 panels and there'll be one for each of everybody. And they, even though it's during the week and into the weekend, they're all recorded and you'll be able to watch them later if you have registered. So it, it's a great value for 60 bucks. So join us. Does sound fantastic, and uh, maybe next year it'll be in in person. Hopefully, but we'll go back. And when it's virtual, the advantage is that even if you know sometimes panels run uh, at the same time, but then if it's recorded, you can see it later. And um, so I've been going to a lot of these book conferences, and I think they're great. Uh, hearing a, a writer and author in person really brings uh, you know adds. A, another dimension to the book that you're reading. You kind of 
understand where they're coming from a lot better. So I really recommend, um, you know, going for a book conference. It's great fun. And uh, if they are, this is your last chance to ask any questions. Uh, but if, from Christopher, if you have any questions or any comments, I will be sending out a follow-up email with all sorts of information and especially the survey. Uh, as soon as the link is up on YouTube, I'll be sharing that too. But meanwhile, if you have any questions, that would be, yes. Uh, I think this was a great presentation. Kathy, Sherry, everybody is saying it's a great presentation. Why is psychological suspense so popular now? That's an interesting question, Sherry. Um, I think, I think readers like to read things about things that could happen to them. And most of those domestic and psychological suspense novels are at a level where we could actually have some of those things happen, hopefully not to the level of a murder. Um, but certainly everybody knows people who've been through affairs and those kind of things and they all weave into those. So I think that's part of the reason. And I just think we're very interested in, in the psychology behind what makes people do what they do, whether they're good things or bad things. And, and, and that lets you um, get a glimpse of that. Uh, Deidre had a really good question. She wanted to know, um, how do you select the books that you read? I do a lot of research before um, every year. I mean, every month I do research, but at the beginning of the year, I look at what's coming out. I mean, I talk to publishers. I have connections with most publishers. So they're, they're, they're keeping things on my radar. They know what my interests are. Um, I read, like I said, I, I won't post a negative review. I never have posted negative reviews. So if I don't like a book, I don't talk about it. It doesn't mean I like every book I've read. There are many I don't like. I just don't talk about it because I know somebody else will like it and I don't want to steer anyone away from a book. But I do try to highlight books that I love, that I hope people will love. And I've heard from people who followed the blog for years. It started in 2020. Well, um, so uh, people have been following it for years. They tell me that they, they've grown to understand my tastes and they can base what their opinion of a book will be off of what I say based on their own opinion. So if you follow a reviewer long enough, you get to know whether you agree with them or disagree with them. I mean, you may completely disagree with me, but you can still follow me because then you know, well, if I loved it, don't read it. <laughs> so, I mean, it could go either way. And um, Kathy wanted to know why, why did you say you could not talk much about Goodnight Beautiful? It's because of the, the, the plot is so intricate, like anything I tell you would be a spoiler. I can't, I mean, it, it, there's a spoiler very early in the book. Normally I can talk about a book and give you like the first 50 pages and talk about it. I can't talk about much of this book at all because there's a twist very, very early in the book. So um, what I could tell you was about it, but if I told anything else, it would spoil the book for anybody and I'm not going to do that. <laughs> not for a mystery. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much, Christopher. This was excellent. And uh, I, I cannot wait to look at the recording myself. <laughs> So that because, um, you know, so many of these names I've heard, but now I'm going to go back and kind of put them on hold. Uh, or you can go to Books with the Past and buy them and support our local bookstore. This is another thing I try to do with the blog is I try, I mean, I read like, I mean, I read everybody in the field, but I don't normally review, like you're not going to see a review from Stephen King on my blog because he doesn't need the help. So I really do try to give the authors who are mid-list and, and, and lower some attention because those big people are getting covered everywhere else. So while I do read those books, I just tend not to review them because I just think that they've already got the coverage they need. And I think that that's great because like you said, uh, you know, it's difficult for an author to get established in such a market. It is a very tough market to kind of make a mark in. So and I'm then sure the pandemic can... just made it more difficult. So. <laughs> it did, it did. For, for both authors and booksellers, it did. Well, thank you everybody. Have a great, great weekend. Since we've got all of our summer reads now in our hand, we should have, a, have it all set. Take care then. Thanks so Bye. much. Thanks, Christopher.